This morning we're going to finish up the series that I've been on for uh, the month of November. We're looking at Romans 7 and 8, and we've looked at several things. Chapter 7, Paul told the Romans that uh, we are captive by sin, and, and it has made us a prisoner. But the cross of Jesus sets us free from our prison of sin. And then we moved on to chapter 8, and we saw how God transforms our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit and how he adopts us as his children. And that even though we struggle and suffer and have trials on earth, even after we're saved, Paul reminds us that there is a future coming that is so much better than anything else we could possibly imagine. So he talks about our future glory. And then today we're going to move to the end of chapter 8 and see that we are more than conquerors. Somebody say amen. Amen. We are more than conquerors because of what Christ has done for us. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So I want to start by looking at uh, Romans chapter 8. Let's start with verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. There's a story told, and I don't know if it's really true, but it's interesting anyways. There's a story told about an African king who had a very good friend of his, and they would often go out hunting together. And uh, his friend had this habit of always saying, it's good, it's, everything is good. So no matter what happened, whether something good happened or whether something bad happened, the king's friend would always say, well, that's good. And it kind of got on the king's nerves a little bit. One day they were out hunting, and uh, somebody would take the king's gun and load it and hand it to him, and so it would be prepared. And Evidently, one of those times when the guy handed it to the king, he he had done something wrong to the gun. And when the king fired it, it blew his thumb off. And uh, the king's friend walked over to him and he saw what happened. He looked at his missing thumb and he said, oh, that's good. And the king was furious. He was like, this is not good. How can this possibly be good? I'm sick and tired of you telling me that everything is good. He was so mad, he had his friend sent to jail. And his friend spent like a year in jail. Well, a year later, the king is out hunting again. And this time he went to a territory where he should not have been hunting. It was a territory that was ruled by cannibals. And he was captured. And the cannibals took him back to their camp. They tied him all up on a stick. And they got piled up some wood. And they brought him over to the pile of wood. And they were just about to light him on fire. When somebody looked down and noticed his missing thumb. Well, they were pretty superstitious, and they would never eat anybody unless they were whole. And so they, t- they, loosed, they took all the ropes off and sent him on his way. And as he was walking back home, he st- thought about it. He thought, wow, you know, that, that uh, friend of mine was telling me that it was good when my thumb was blown off. It really was good. And now I feel kind of bad about it. And so he went back, and he, he found his friend in jail, and he said, look, I just want to apologize And he told him the whole story about the cannibals and how they wouldn't eat him because he had a missing thumb. And he said, you were right. It is good that my thumb is missing. And uh, I'm so sorry that I put you in jail. That was wrong of me. That was really bad. And the guy said, no, no, it's good. He said, no, listen, how can it be good that I put you in jail and and, uh, you've been in here for a whole year? And the guy says, well, if I hadn't been in jail, I would have been with you and they would have set you free and they would have eaten me. (laughs) So, you know, there are some people who can find the silver lining in everything. You ever notice that? Some people can find the good in all kinds of things. You ever ever use that phrase, it's all good, it's all good. Uh, We've got a friend uh, that we met in college, and she can't stand it when someone says, it's all good, because everything's not all good. But we're used to saying things like that, aren't we? It's all good, don't worry about it, no worries, it's okay. But everything that happens in our life is not all good. I mean, you and I can think of plenty of examples of things probably in the last week that happened to us that we would say, well, that wasn't really good. I mean, think about this. Imagine that, I'm going to make you hungry. Imagine that you went to the store and you got the the most expensive cut of steak that they had. It was a beautiful filet. And you brought it home and you aged it for several days in the fridge until it got just right. And then you took it out on the grill and you grilled it to perfection. You bring it in the house and set it on the plate. You go back into the kitchen to get something and you come back and find your dog has just eaten your steak. Is that good? No, that's not good. I mean, that'll make you mad. 
So everything that happens to us is not good. <laughs> yeah, it's good for the dog. It's not good for us. But this verse, Romans 8, 28, is not teaching us that everything that happens is good, is it? It's teaching us that everything that happens, whether it's good or bad, God can take it and weave it together to make something beautiful out of it. So all the things that happen in your life, imagine all of the things that happen. Some things are good and some things are not so good. But yet God can somehow take all of those different things and yet weave them together so that in the end, when we look back on our life, we can see how God took even the bad things and he, and he used them for our good. It's like making a quilt. Uh, we got any quilt makers here? Some people that make, yeah, we got someone over there. My mom makes quilts. And uh, you, you guys can take like little pieces of fabric and sometimes people can take like old clothes or a discarded piece of fabric and, and put them all together in a quilt. Individually, those little pieces of fabric might not seem like much. And some of them might even seem worthless or ugly. But yet in the right hands, in the hands of someone who is skilled, it can turn into a nice tapestry, a wonderful quilt. That's kind of what life can be like if we will let God uh, work in our lives to do good. I remember personally in my own life, uh, my wife and I met at Lee College in Cleveland, Tennessee um, a few years back. And uh, when, when I had gone through three years of college, I ran out of money and I thought, well, I'll just go into the Air Force and get a little bit extra money to go back uh, to college and finish up. So I went into the Air Force. Jan finished her last year of college and then we got married. And we spent our first few years together in South Carolina, and I served in the Air Force. When it came time for us to get out, we had switched from the Church of God to the Assembly of God. So I thought, well, instead of going back to Lee, where I started, which was a Church of God college, I ought to go to an Assembly of God college, Southeastern in Florida. And I thought, okay, well, I'll, well, I'll go there. So it was getting close to, to the time when I would be discharged from the military, and Jane and I took a trip down to Lakeland, Florida to check things out and look at the job situation and the school and everything. And so uh, we had made all of our plans. Everything looked good. Came back home and the Gulf War started. And then I couldn't get out of the Air Force. And they held everybody. They said, nobody's getting out. And so it wasn't until the next year that they started releasing people from their obligation. And they said, well, okay, now you can get out. Well, now we had to make plans all over again because it had been uh, almost a year. So we went back down to Lakeland again and checked everything out, looked at the job situation, apartments and school and everything. This time, nothing was working out. Job situation looked horrible. Apartments didn't look like that was going to work out. And, and school was looking even worse because it looked like they were going to make me take an extra year of classes to get my degree. And I thought, this is terrible. I was really upset called our pastor back home and shared with him what was going on and he said well Joe it looks like maybe the Lord's closing that door and so instead of going to Southeastern I went back to Lee where I started my degree and Jan and Aaron we had Aaron at the time he was just a two-year-old they came here and lived with her mom and dad in Birmingham I didn't know all the things that would transpire going back to Lee I met uh I met a professor that became a mentor that to this day is still a mentor in my life. And we ended up staying here at this church because of all of that. So if God had not closed the door in Florida, then this door would not have opened and I wouldn't be here with you today. And so I consider myself very blessed to be able to be here in Birmingham and to be in this church and to be your pastor. And none of that would have ever come about if we had gone ahead and, and moved to Florida and, and done those things. So what looked to me like a bad situation was actually a good thing, and it turned out for our good. So we need to think about that when we're going through something in our life and we think, well, this is terrible and, and this is awful and I can't believe this is happening and all these doors are closing. And You need to understand something. God is for you, and he will help you. We need to remember this. Let's go to the next verse. Romans 8, 31 is what we're going to look at next. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How many of you believe that God is for you? God is for us. 
He's not against us. God wants the best for us. I know sometimes we feel like God must be really mad at me because my life is so miserable and all these bad things are happening and uh, he, he must not like me very much. Maybe he, maybe he doesn't love me. But I want you to know this morning that God does love us. He does care about us and that he's for us. Paul knew this. And there are several things that I want to just uh, kind of touch on very quickly to remind us that God is for us. So let me just go through a few things. <clears throat> the very fact that you and I are alive today is a testimony to the fact that God is for us. Do you realize that God created the entire universe so that you and I could have life? You think about that. We've never found any other life anywhere else in the universe. We can't see from one end to the other. It's so huge. We don't even know how big it is. But as far as we know, we are the only living creatures in all of the universe. But it takes an entire universe for us to exist. And God did that for us. We have life today because God created everything that exists. And then this. He, uh, oh, let me, let me read the scripture. Isaiah 42, 5. God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. We have, we've been given life today because God breathed life into us. Secondly, he became poor so that we could become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus gave up the splendor of heaven, all of his divine prerogatives, to come down to earth, to empty himself of his glory and his power and become like us. He became poor so that you and I could be rich. There were times when, when Jesus would say to somebody, you know what, I don't have a place to lay my head at night. He wasn't a wealthy person on this earth. He was a, he was a servant to the people. He became less so that we could become more. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says this, and I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. It's a little different. It says this. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Jesus did all of that for us. Now let's think about that last part, that he died by crucifixion. And that brings up our next point. He died on the cross so that we might live. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 says this, Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. We have eternity, eternal life, an eternity with Christ because Jesus was willing to die on the cross. And he's given us his spirit, John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. We are not left alone on this earth. Jesus lives with us and in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So today the Lord is present in this place and he's present in us. We are not alone. He is for us. He's with us. And he's in us. God is for us. We need to understand this. The Lord is for us. Let's go back and read that verse one more time. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Can sickness and disease be against us? What about the story of Abraham and Sarah? They couldn't have children, and yet God made it possible for them to, to have children, and Abraham is the father of many nations. Can our family be against us? Joseph's own family sold him into slavery, and yet God elevated him to the second in power of Egypt. 
Can uh, rulers and authorities be against us? Pharaoh tried to kill the Egyptians, and yet God wiped them out in the Red Sea as he let the uh, Israelites go through. Can our co-workers be against us? Remember Daniel? He, his co-workers conspired against him, and he ended up getting thrown into a den of lions. But God shut the mouths of the lions, and so he was protected and saved. Can our enemies be against us? The king of Assyria sent 185,000 troops against Israel and Jerusalem. And yet in one night, one angel of God came through and wiped out the entire army and saved uh, the city. Can poverty be against us? There was a widow in, in the land in the days of Elijah who was poor and was about to die because she ran out of food. And yet God made sure that the oil and the flour in her house did not run out until the famine was over with. Can the devil be against us? Satan took everything away from Job, and yet God restored to him more than he ever had to begin with. Can death be against us? Jesus died on a cross, but then he rose again from the grave, and he lives forevermore so that we can live too. Nothing can be against us because God is for us. You understand? God is for us. What can be against us? Nothing. Nothing. I'm so thankful that the Lord is for us today. The greatest way in which God is for us is the fact that he has forgiven us of all of our sin. Romans 8, 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. You know, sometimes we feel guilty for all of the sins of our past. Maybe the, the enemy brings up something out of our past, digs something up way from behind us and says, you know what, you were a horrible scoundrel, weren't you? You were pretty rotten, weren't you? Maybe, maybe it's not the enemy, maybe it's our own conscience sometimes that tries to dig something up from our past and say, oh man, think about that horrible sin that you committed. Don't you feel bad about that? Here's the thing, though. The Lord has forgiven us. He forgives us, and he forgets it. And when we stand before God on the day of judgment, he's not going to bring back all of those sins that we committed and we've asked forgiveness for because they're completely wiped from our, our slate. He cleans our slate all the, all the way. So he says, what sins? I don't remember any sins because they're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Don't let the enemy come in against you and tell you that you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel because you aren't. You're a blood-bought, born-again believer, a child of the king. The Lord has redeemed you. He has saved you. He has forgiven you. And you are cleansed of all of the sins in the past. And let's thank God for that, that he has redeemed us and set us free. Nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us. And that's where Paul goes next. Now, when we talk about love, we are most of the time bound by our own human understanding of what love is like. We think of love a lot of times in the terms that society and culture thinks of love. I will love you if you'll do this. I'll love you if you'll love me back. I'll love you as long as you don't, and then fill in the blank. But see, God doesn't love in the same way that humans love. God's love is unconditional. God's love is the kind of love that, that is not bound by our own circumstances. He loves us no matter what. He doesn't wake up one morning angry at us and say, well, I'm not going to love them anymore. They just, they just really ticked me off. God doesn't do that to us. Look at what Paul says, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Think about that. What can separate us from the love of God? There is nothing on earth. There is nothing in the universe. There is nothing in this realm or in the spiritual realm 
that can separate you and me from the love that God has for us. Our circumstances do not define us. Our defeat doesn't determine our destiny and our villains cannot take away our victory because Jesus loves us no matter what. His love will never stop. It will never dry up. It will never lose its passion and power. Verse 38, he continues, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. We humans can be fickle people. And we can, uh, we can use love as a way to manipulate somebody. And we can withhold our affections from someone because we're angry at them. But God isn't like us. God loves us always, unconditionally. You and I are the apple of his eye. He loves us so much that he sent his son to die on a cross. I mean, that's love. Jesus himself said, this is is how you know what love is, that you lay down your life for somebody. And he said, that's what I'm doing for you. He truly loves us. And there isn't a thing in the universe that can separate us from the love that God has for us. At the end of the day, we need to understand this. You and I, are more than conquerors because of what Christ did for us. And we always will be more than conquerors. No matter what you face, whether this week or next month or next year or any time in the future, no matter what you face, understand something, that God is for you and he is with you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never stop loving you. And that even in the the deepest despair and darkest pit of our life, we can still lift up our chin and say, you know what? I'm still more than a conqueror because I have what really matters. I have the love of God in my life. He cares for me and he's for me. And at the end of the day, he's going to make all of this come out good. I don't even know how it's going to happen, but God's going to make it come out good because he loves me. And he cares, he cares about me. And we may, not, we may not ever see the good on this side of life. It might not be until we get to heaven. But I know for a fact that God will make sure that everything comes out right. If we'll continue to trust him and let him lead us and guide us every step of our life, we can become more than conquerors. Amen. Let's pray.